live streaming is on. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, hopefully, uh, you are just joining us here with our uh, YouTube live streaming. And uh, thanks to everyone that continues to join week after week. I'm Dan Gay. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer of Block Search Blockchain. And uh, this morning or this evening, depending on where you are in the world, we're joined by uh, Mr. Daniele Mincy, who was uh, uh, gone last week, and we're glad to have you back. Uh, welcome from Italy. Thank you. Pleasure being here. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Absolutely. Thank you. And then uh, also our Chief Executive Officer and the founder of Blockstrips Blockchain, uh, Mr. Tim Vasco. Hey, Tim. Good to see Hi, Dan. Morning. How are you? Great to be here Friday. Great. Yeah, yeah it's amazing how fast it's going. going today, so. Yeah. So, uh, great. So this morning, we'll get right to it. because It's uh, casual day on Friday, isn't it? Yeah, it is casual day, so I'm not sure. I, I, All right. I put on a nicer shirt. But... I'm wearing the tie. Probably yeah. Yeah. the tie, it was five years ago. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this morning, we'll get to it because we only have 30 minutes here. And uh, we're going to talk about the seven. I actually was going to do 12, but we'll do seven business reasons why KYC is needed for every business and really integrating that into everything that you do. And uh, last week we talked about ID cert and we had such an overwhelming uh, response and questions that uh, we decided to uh, continue uh, discussing this. And um, KYC being know your customer and uh, securing everything that's important to you in your business. And today we're going to talk about something that we call the authenticated handshake, which is uh, something that Tim developed um, that over years ago. Um, and then to start, you know, also identity isn't a one-time thing, and we're going to talk about why it's an always something that uh, you need to be checking and doing and having automated. And uh, that really comes to the first point, Tim, that I'll just ask you about, and uh, just share with us what the authenticated handshake is and why that's important to us. Well, well I think in a digital world, Dan, um, we, we just need to be aware that every time we get online, especially in a business environment, we are um, dealing with people and we need to know it's actually that person on the other side. And that's true whether it be a transaction, it be a document we're sharing or signing, it be a um, login into our area that could have confidential information or even just proprietary ideas, conversations, things we want to be private about. Right. And so the authenticated handshake is exactly that. It's like thinking about that hand, uh, that same hand as you would have had in the face-to-face -face world and saying, hello, I'm Tim, you know it's me. And, and naturally today, we can't do that anymore. We don't shake hands even when we are in the physical world. What do we do, bump elbows nope. or, you know, I don't it's think- It's quite awkward, do. actually. You, what do you do? Yeah, I, I mean, what do you do? And and I, I find myself now, even when I do meet people, wanting to shake hands and I can't. So when, when you're doing that, you're seeing the person's face, you're seeing their, uh, you're hearing their voice. You have all those biometric clues when you're in the real world. Well, we've replicated that in the digital world. Um, we have, and as you just saw down a few minutes ago, this right. amazing new function, no spoiler alerts coming out, which is, um, is integrated access management, permission management. What I call is the, uh, um, uh, there's MFA, which is multi-factor authentication. Most of us are used to that where we can take our device, our mobile device, and we can scan. And we've got that built into the platform. But there is now multi-authentication, uh, 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 multi-factor authentication, MFA, which is many different ways to authenticate that that's the actual person. Right. So we start with a private key. Then we can have tracking of various things on a private basis that only that person knows and that they can share to say, yes, this is actually Tim. That's the authenticated handshake. And when you think about it, that's the digital world meets the face to face world. And 
and we do that. So I'll give you an example. We've released our sign certain. Now we did a short brief demo of that a couple of weeks ago, actually. Right. right. Now, when I combine a, um, a video like we have today, we'll show this next, not next week because it's American Thanksgiving. So we'll be offline, but in the next bit, um, we're going to show sign certain where I can turn on my recording. You can watch me sign something. You already know I came in because I'm authenticated through ID certain and I can have a chat with you and you're geolocating me. And because I came in through ID certain, I've been facially recognized. That's better than a notary. Yeah. Well, that's, that's isn't that like the ultimate deal room? <laughs> that is the ultimate deal room. That's exactly right. It's like, there is no question. And not only that, you're also, we're also able to capture your vector graphic signature so we can authenticate that and the device and location you're at at that precise moment. Right. All of that is hashed to the blockchain. I no longer have to have this idea of a second ink signature from some unknown person that says I've notarized or witnessed Dan signing that. Right. By by just showing an ID, which we all know how easily IDs are to fake. So exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So this is more secure than the real world. It is more of an authenticated handshake. And we're doing that so fast. That's why we call it the digital fly zone. This is all happening simultaneously. And when we've completed that signature, you're recording your, your hashed blockchain hashed private ID, your video of you signing it, your signature, everything is in one place and the document and it's version controlled. So if I sign it, I said, oops, I messed up. We can put another version up there. We can line things out. We can redo it. And it's all there recorded. If there's ever a question, it's there. That's the authenticated handshake. That's what it means. Perfect. Thank you, Tim. And um, I'm going to go to question number two, Daniele, about uh, fraud. And uh, this is one secure place to eliminate fraud to remove risks from your business and you might tell us a little bit more about uh, encryption how it locks everything and um, why this is important is not only the front end but uh, working in your deal room and, and working uh, across different uh, applications I will, um, I will say something which is uh, you know for most of the people that have not been dealing with operations in fraud as unfortunately right. I've done in the past, uh, the best way to eliminate fraud is uh, to increase sales. Let me explain. What does it mean? Um, so think about for a minute, you can increase your control, your alert by increasing uh, uh, the steps, the verification steps until right. a case is being validated to eliminate the risk of fraud but somehow you have a payoff because you might have some legitimate fraud case that you're a legitimate or true genuine sales case that you reject because of the KYC or fraud checks don't pass. In that case, you might reject a genuine uh, sales case. So in fact, uh, by bringing the focus of how can I accept 100% of the request I'm having and just to smooth down the, um, the fraud, uh, uh, the true positives. So right. the best way, to do this is, uh, first of all, to put the barrier so high for fraudsters that uh, this means you have so many checks that are done in a very short amount of time that potentially any fraudster will not be able to, to attack your business. So the multi-factor authentication that team mentioned is just one. But uh, from a much more philosophical perspective, uh, um, KYC, it's a way to enable trust, okay? So, right. and uh, trust is at the essence of the relationship between a consumer or a business and a brand. Right. This means KYC is a mean of increasing brand perception and then to have a higher level of trust and ultimately to increase sales at the expense of frauds. Right. So that's why I'm saying <laughs> we need to increase sales to reduce 
uh, fraud because from a from a seal code point of view, you have to follow these steps. Awesome, awesome, um, great feedback on there. And then Tim, uh, we can't see you right now, but I was going to ask you the next question. Number three is um, you know sharing the integration and how important it is to take uh, KYC and implement that with private keys, smart tags, logs, managing access and information. Um, so you might talk a little bit about, you know, how you first get in with KYC and then why private keys and all those uh, smart tags, et cetera, logs are important, how that moves it along the system versus okay. having it sitting outside as what banks have had in the past with a KYC, which is a one-time thing that they uh, bring a customer on, but it's really not integrated with anything. Yeah, so so the <clears throat> the fundamental problem with um, having everything disconnected is, first of all, there are so many areas, if we just think about it, that can be um, so much information that can be lost. So just think about time. Let's talk about that in the first place. Time itself is very valuable and it's very difficult for us to manage our time as it is. So when we've got everything in multiple places and we're always out there kind of looking for this stuff, um, what's happening, Dan, is we're, we're losing productivity, right? So let's right. talk about just productivity and and person hours when we start out. Then we, we go into the next problem, which is um, when we have to retrieve that information. So let's say that there's a need to go find out, is this really the person that I'm working with, or does this person, should this person have access to this information? Banks traditionally, I actually opened a bank account during COVID here, it was quite an experience. I said, I was joking with the uh, guy, I said, it's the first time I've ever entered a bank with a mask on and, and uh, <laughs> um, you know, not being kicked out, but, but I still signed the signature card, right? right? And he said, okay, well, this is gonna be kept behind the counter. How archaic is that? Um, you know, my signature should be electronically validated. You should be able to look at that vector graphic and say, that's an actual signature that's tied to that person, that ID. And by doing this with a private key that's authenticated, a QR code that knows it's Tim, again, I can just take my device, scan it, and there's a whole bunch of stuff there that relates all of that information back to me. So no matter what the transaction is, um, you actually know it's me, but it's a matter of pure convenience. Like right. instantly for me as the customer, I know what I've signed. It's on my customer record automatically private to me. And if you and I have done it together, you and I have access to just those documents, right. not somebody who goes and I don't even know who it is, and picks up my file and there's a whole bunch of stuff. So that applies to medical records, that applies to financial records, it applies to my identity, it applies to my business, it applies to everything. If it's mine, I should have access to it, but I should also know who else has access to it and who else is able to view this. And if I wanna give permission, that's my right. That's my opportunity to do it. This isn't, a country uh, in the world, most countries in the world other than China, and a few of those have complete surveillance. We don't want that in our society. We want privacy as well as flexibility. So it's absolutely critical that, that we do that. And we've seen this played out in a thousand ways where it's bad. We've right. seen it played out by institutions where it's bad like when Wells Fargo made a millions of fake accounts, right? Right. That can't happen right. anymore. And so we don't, we, we've learned that trusting centralized authorities maybe isn't really always the best thing. And although most of the atten in intentions might be great, what if they aren't? Right. What if we see these kinds of situations and they aren't? And what if we're literally a victim of that 
both as a member of society or a member of that, uh, a, a customer of that company. Right. So it, it is archaic and, and it's, it's time to change it, not only because we're in a situation where lockdowns can happen in a moment's notice, um, but also be, because the way information has been managed has really been ineffective and it just needed to change. The pandemic has just accelerated that change, as I've said before. Right. And then, Tim, you mentioned one word as you were speaking there, and that is trust. And right. that, that's the key to this is trusting who you're working with, who's on the other end of everything that you're doing. And then even pulling something up six months later, a year later, uh, you both have access to that same information. Uh, so it would be very difficult to say, well, I said this or I meant this when it's all right there in documents, uh, in in instant messages and even video recordings. So the intent is there. Uh, so it creates trust in documents and everything that you do. It, it's, it's, we stop reinventing history here. Right. Like how many times have we heard, I didn't say that. <laughs> uh, most recently in the last, I, I don't want to get political here, but in the last four years, this was said, no, I didn't, you know, and it's documented. This is a way to really create that chain of authenticated handshake. I said this, I meant this, when things were great and we were best friends and we were getting involved in a business together, this is exactly what happened. Things get a little bit tough. People have selective memory. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Can, I, can I just add a bit there to give you yes, a real, real, world, a real world example? Yeah, one of the first one of the first transactions I've done in uh, one of the company I created in the past. So I first remember I asked um, a, a, an investor that was about to invest in the company uh, to exchange an NDA, and also I asked the investor to provide his ID, you know, to attach to the NDA to make sure I was talking to the right guy on the other side. And the guy told me, first of all, we don't sign NDA and forget about exchanging my ID because I don't know how you're going to store. OK, so at that, at that moment in time, either if I wanted to continue, I had to accept the rules of the game. And I was kind of in an unfavorable <laughs> position. On the other side, uh, um, I could have said, OK, sorry, um, let's let's stop here. Right now, we're dealing with investors and we have investors that are on board into our platform without any type of concerns in terms of vetting their identity to be part of the platform. Now I'm talking about Fusion Funder. So this means here there is a psychological hack. As long as you put this as a kind of an exception rule, say it's me because I don't trust, it's a negative context. Right. But then if you say that KYC is the foundation to enable trust over a transaction beyond the banking system that both people trust each other. So that's why we are hacking the KYC perception in everyday's business to make a KYC a valuable element for both of you know, the parties to transact with peace of mind and full of trust. Yeah, and really it's about protecting them as well. It's not about just protecting you and that, you know, changing that perception as well. It's about protecting everyone. That's yeah, right. To, That's to right. your point, Daniele, like, like who wants their identity stolen? How brutal right. is that? Who wants their credit score affected by that? Who wants, you know, their private information out there so it can just be hacked or used in a way that you didn't expect, right? That's and, right. and so it, it keeps everybody on the same page. And it, it goes back to that old school idea of my handshake is my work. Right. And that's what the authenticated handshake means. It's like, and, and I have done my most successful work in my career on a handshake, right? right? And those contracts, those those things that we do, why should we argue about the nuances of them? Hey, here's a recording. Here's the here's what we agreed to. That's the whole idea of a smart contract. So so when when smart contracts were first brought out, I want to bring this point up. It was, it was thought, oh, well, this is just computer executing code. And so everything happens automatically. That's part of it, yes. But the other part of it is 
and I, I've used this term many times, HITS, human intelligence tasks. These, what we do as humans in our organizations, whether it be investing or healthcare or purchasing or vendor relationships or, or employee relationships or contractor relationship, anything we do, those are all human intelligence tasks. It's how we work together. Right. Now, if we bring all these factors together, that's a true smart contract, isn't it? it like, is. yeah. like really, if you look at the fundamentals of contract law, an oral agreement can be a contract. You don't have to sign something. This goes back to case law way, way back into the 1700s and when, when common law started. So, so what, what we have today is this ability to walk through that relationship, that true kind of digital relationship in a way that everybody has a true track of what happened and got us to this point here and now we can transact based on that. Adding code into that, bringing this through code all the way through gives us a true smart contract value chain. It gives us true identity. It gives us protection on all sides. And that I think philosophically, Dan, changes the game because now when we go, yeah, and it's all there. And yes, the world was like that back then. Think about the world back in January, but it's changed. Deals have changed. The world's changed. And how many websites do you see today that say, oh, if you're affected by COVID, call us. People are awful. They understand things change, right? right. And businesses aren't awful. It's the awful systems we've had around that to make it easy to game the system or those, what I'd like to say are rare few who want to uh, cheat, I don't know what else to say, right? Yeah. Most people don't, most people say, and, you know and most that? organizations will, will be a, adjust to situations and, and that's what's happening in the world today. You know what is the average, average fraud rate? Every, I don't like the averages in general. But uh, let's say, what is the average fraud rate uh, across all the industries? I'm talking about all the businesses in the world. Do you know how much is going to be? How much is? So, which is between 1%, that's much more sophisticated and financial in, in um, um, industries, up to 3%, which are much more, for example, e-commerce. Initially, PayPal, when they launched their service, they have a fraud rate that was about 15%. Wow. Wow. And then they were about to stop the project because of the high fraud rate they had. So it was killing their business. So right now, fraud rate is between 1% and 3% into any business. So you cannot eliminate fraud unless you shut down your business. But you have to mitigate and bring it down to a level that you can tolerate. Well, Daniele, since you're talking about that, one of the questions is actually about uh, the GDPR and the you know a lot of uh, compliance rules that are out there now in the last couple of years and um, if you can just talk a little bit about that because uh, this is key to mitigating risk and mitigating the kinds of uh, penalties like uh, facebook had a over billion dollar penalty other companies the average penalty for exposing customers is about uh, close to two million dollars and that's for even small businesses right. so to me this is much more a mindset issue, it's not a tech issue. Yeah. So since the foundation of a business, you should immediately be able to spot how these guys are dealing with data. If they take care about this problem, issue, whatever, at the foundation of their idea, or it's something that is just a cost of right. compliance yeah. that uh, they, they have to do, but it's somehow that it's hurting because it costs money, it doesn't bring value. So what we're doing is um, uh, it's rather different in the sense that uh, privacy or privacy, as someone says, is embedded, is core of what we're doing in the sense that uh, any user of our platform, any stakeholder of the platform is the owner of the data. So you can comply in different manners with whatever data protection act or data protection rule. For example, in Switzerland, GDPR does not apply. So right. there is a data protection act, which is similar to the GDPR, the principles are the same, 
at the end of the day, you have to uh, you have to explain to the regulator how you deal with the data. And if someone eventually can copy the data and bring the data outside the country, <laughs> it's kind of weird. So yeah. in fact, uh, for us, protecting data, it means we put the users in control of the data through Gout, so-called private key. So this means you own the data. So we complying with uh, uh, data protection acts or GDPR by having users protecting the data and under no ground we can process users' data. So we are not the data processor that can exploit data and sell to third parties. So that's a smart way for us to comply with, not with GDPR, with any data protection act. Right, okay, awesome. And I've got two more questions. Um, one of them is a favor of mine, that's onboarding employees. And Tim, you might talk about uh, just the onboarding process with employees, then Daniele, uh, onboarding with Fusion Funder and, you know, that process as well. Well, I think that the most important part of, uh, you know, that whole idea of trust is once we become engaged with a company as an employee, um, we want to trust our employer and vice versa. Our employer wants to trust us. So we start looking at everything from that initial engagement um, this is who I say I am, my, my resume is real, my credentials are real, things like that, to policies and procedures. These are, this is how our company works. This is our culture. These are the things that we do to manage our business, to make sure that we're you know, uh, attentive to the services and we provide to our customers and clients and how we handle their information. So now we're starting to say, look, if you're going to join this company, you're going to manage information in this way for our customers. So that extends the trust um, trust bubble, if you will. Right. And by doing that, you're actually creating this idea that not only with your teams, but your bigger world that makes your business have value in the world, you take trust and authentication seriously. You take privacy seriously. And you start building this idea of what I call trustonomics around your business. It's the economic value that trust brings. And it does start from that first engagement with an employee. So whether your employees are already there or they're, um, they're e new employees, you still have this whole part of your business that is responsible to the customers. And even more so, we've seen it over and over. You mentioned um, penalties, Dan. How many billions right. of dollars of penalties are being handed out because of hacks and custom leaks of customer information? Billions of dollars. You know, you know how Ooh. big enterprises, you know how big enterprises solving this problem right now? With a with this kind of, I mean, right now in the last 20 years, with a kind of a, um, a referral program. So if you ask an employee to bring another employee on board, you, you are not reassured that the new employee that eventually will come is any better, or it will be the best possible employee or the candidate for that position. But by the fact that you ask a, a, an existing employee to be on board, to, to, to recommend someone else, you're almost sure it will not be a total disaster and it might not likely to be a fraudster. So, yeah. You can remove, but at the end of the day, it's kind of you know it's kind of weird setup because you can do it much much more easily as we're doing. Well, exactly, it, it, it is, and it, I I just I always give an example of somebody I talk to who's a CFO of a construction company, and what they go through on onboarding their employees. You know, they have to have their employees uh, do scan their driver's license. They send it via an email. Somebody copies that. They put it into a, a you know a file. And it's just a very uh, clunky and laborious process versus having the ability to do it all online and have someone follow an actual process. Um, so you're eliminating a bunch of steps in, in the process, back and forth emails in the process, and it just becomes very streamlined to um, onboard somebody, but also to give them information that um, this is the same each time with every single employee. And then also, uh, to uh, to protect your company as far as risk in terms of background checks and that type of thing as well. 
and and collaboration, Dan. So oh, and absolutely you know, collaboration. And, and so let's go into let's go into what happens to companies and and employees when they do get in a dispute or something. And once we have this collaborative string and we're running this through a transaction that is documented. And I can tell you, I, I opened one of our uh, activity channels the other day and was looking at it. It's a very busy channel. We had over 17,000 posts all logged right there. So at any given point in time, I can go back so I can go back years in, in the block search system. I can literally go back years and look at what was happening at that point of time with whom and have it authenticated that that person was actually involved in that. There's never a question. Right. And for just pure management and analytics, that's huge. But when we start getting into things about, uh, employment relations disputes, when we get into privacy, you can see how broad and wide that becomes. And that's why we call it trustonomics. It's a, it's a, the entire economics of the firm depend on this. And it all starts, starts with employee onboarding. It starts with, here you go, get that authenticated handshake in place at first. And then what do you want to do with it to make yeah. sure that that trail is there at all times? Does it speed the process up? Absolutely. If all you did was do this just to speed up your onboarding process and your filing system, you'd be smart. Yeah, but there's yeah. so much more to it. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to end this on one more question, and that is having KYC off on the side uh, like banks have had for years versus integrating to other applications. And I just wanted to just share about the, the digital dozen and let's talk about how this can be integrated into everything that you do versus uh, a one-time uh, KYC. And that's the whole point of the authenticated handshake is that it's an always time, all of the time thing, not a one-time thing. And then uh, Tim and, um, and Danielle, if you could just talk about how this is integrated into the digital dozen and um, the deal rooms and everything from video yeah, to I everything. I can start much more, I mean, I can, briefly intro from a business perspective team can eventually more go a little bit more detail on the tech side so in fact uh, um from a business standpoint it's a you know it's super straightforward in the sense that for example on fusion funder which is a matchmaking platform so you have from one side you have issuer so the company willing to raise capital that we match make towards um, a network of investors and eventually both of them have to have to pass kyc so it's a very seamless process. It's a three-step process. There's no, at the moment, there are no different levels because levels of KYC depends much more on the severity of the transaction, typically in the banking system. You might have level one, two, three. If you, for example, you want to process a very large transaction in the region of 100 million, that case might ask more information. But then if you just need to, you know, present people and eventually after a level of validation, go to the next step, you go through a level of validation, you know, checking documents and so on, but everything is online, either on the desktop, on the mobile. It's very straightforward. Great. Yes, okay, Tim. And so what I was going to say, Dan, is I put up this slide quick, which yeah, we talked about the digital dozen. And the reason is that you can see, even if you have all these applications over here to try and do everything that we're doing with block certs and the technology platform here, Look at the areas where you don't have anything and nobody does any of this. A complete audit trail between all these different functions in the digital dozen is impossible, number one. Right. Um, collaboration in the hub is impossible when you have it all spread out like this. And of course, private key identity authentication, a one-off is definitely not flowing through your entire uh, model like we just talked about. So that's a visual of what happens when you're trying to dance around all these different logins. Your all of your data is stored on these guys' hubs and clouds and things like that. It's not in a place where you can actually do this. You can't really actually do it with current technology. Um, that's why we brought out the Blockshirts platform and brought in all of these elements that. 
blockchain enables us to do. So when you ask about the digital dozen, this integrated access management authentication not only protects identity, but it actually gives you that audit trail. And it actually gives you that ability to uh, exercise the uh, logic of having this handshake go through every transaction and then having even the analytics to be able to do that in your organization or otherwise for compliance and things like that, as Danielle pointed out. So KYC was originally know your customer. Well, it's no longer about know your customer. It's about know your contacts, all of your contacts, and through that stream of what contact actually means and at what level, as Daniele said, can we permission or use this information, share it and store it? That's, that's what's important. Perfect. And that's why you call it the digital fly zone, Tim. That's exactly right. Because try and do that. You know, you're not, you're not flying when you're going this way. You fly straight up to 30,000 feet, you know, like a rocket ship. And if you're going this way, you're kind of taking a lot of on ramps and off ramps and country roads. Yeah, you are. And where's my uh, where's my passcode? Uh, and then you know, trying to integrate all of that is just a jumbled mess. And you know, not to mention the costs of having all those things. So good That's stuff right. today, guys. Um, I think we need to wrap it up. Uh, we've gotten through seven. I actually had twelve. I uh, wanted to focus on the top seven, and um, we will not be here next Friday because of the uh, U.S. holiday of Thanksgiving, um, but we will be back the Friday after that. But uh, Tim, I know you want to talk about our Black Friday. Yeah. So so we want everybody, obviously, to be part of the, uh, of the Trustonomic uh, and Be Certain um, economy. We want everybody to be part, uh, to have this advantage of digital identity. We want everybody to have these tools. We are constantly evolving our, um, we are constantly evolving our, our platform now, our app store. We're gonna have a really cool new uh, twist to the app store when we come back next time that's, that's a new face. But today, you know, we decided, you know what? It's Black Friday coming up. We're going to do the Black Friday, join the community, become part of, of getting your pieces of this software platform, the, the user-powered cloud, and, uh, and get this utility, whether it's in your business or not. So whether you have a business case that you can put your finger on or not, a lot of what we're doing at Block Certs is building out our master's academy of how you do this stuff. This is new. I mean, let's face it, a lot of what we talk about, and that's why we do these webinars, is it's new, but guess what? We're in a new world. We're in a new economic time right now. How do we keep things going while we're in lockdowns? How do we keep things going while we're wearing face masks and things like that? So we, we are here to help everybody build their new digital fly zone. And part of that is we use tokens. We use tokens because a token is actually a software unit that enables you to participate in the community, to control your data, to hold your software in a secure place with all of your data. And certainly we are doing our public launch. Um, actually, we're going to be announcing a big international launch the December 7th. Um, we will be at uh, one of the largest events in the world. So I'm not, no spoiler alerts, just tune in after Thanksgiving, uh, Black Friday. But for right now, we are gonna uh, do a, a two for one um, token and, and uh, platform offering. As you know, these tokens are what power and allow you to set your budget and, and run all of this software. Um, there's a huge bunch of advantages on that. So if you've been involved in the, um, if you've been involved in the other webinars where we talk about how our pricing strategy and token strategy works, or you've heard Daniele talk about it, it's all there. Right now, basically the simple story is 
jump in. It's two times better off between now and the end of the month for you to do it now and become part of uh, become part of the user power cloud, the first one in the world. Perfect. Thank you, Tim. And uh, I know that you always uh, have a saying at the end. That's right. So um, I'm just going to ask everybody, first of all, for everybody around the world, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, I saw where people were coming from all over. It's super late, I think, in Africa right now. And and uh, Daniele, as always, you reminded me today that he's going to go off and have a, a glass of wine after this. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, I'm gonna have my uh, I'm gonna have my next cup of espresso, and because uh, it's still morning here, um, and but I'd like to tell everybody thanks for being here. Next week is Thanksgiving in the United States, so we're thankful that uh, that all of you have supported us. Please enjoy your families. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay digital. And right now, stay at home. It's uh, it's a good time to stay at home. It's the best thing for the world, and we can connect like this all over the world, and that's that's what we're bringing with Block Certs. Perfect. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate you and uh, everyone, as Tim said, around the world, and we'll continue to stream more of these uh, after next week, and we'll, we look forward to announcing, as Tim said, a global event that uh, we're taking part in, which uh, we'll start to announce uh, next week. So thanks for joining us, and we'll be in contact and uh, be safe. And uh, get some tokens and join us on our Black Friday event before our big uh, global launch, international launch, which we'll be announcing uh, week after next. Great, thanks. Cool, thank you. And don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to uh, like us if you like this conversation. Helps us provide more interesting information. Thank you.